Okay, we're going to start our final session of the day, and I think it's going to be a very interesting one uh, with Turkey and Hungary being uh, the focus. I'm very happy that uh, John Connolly agreed to, uh, uh, to uh, chair this uh, event. John is uh, in, the, uh, in the history department and has done many things on, on higher education and dictatorships in uh, the former East Bloc or otherwise. And I also want to note, if I can remember the full name, uh, that uh, we're, we're really pleased that uh, he's the director also of the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and they're a co-sponsor of this event. So uh, in addition, we have, uh, um, we have Jason um, uh, Wittenberg, who's a, a professor in the political science department and knows a lot about uh, uh, events in Hungary. And then we have Brendan. Uh, O'Malley, once again, who is the managing uh, editor of University World News, which is also a partner uh, in this conference. So uh, we're going to now first start off with uh, Brendan to talk about Turkey. Thank you. Uh, University World News is, has a, has a, tries to um, strongly cover academic freedom uh, in its coverage as one part of its coverage, and uh, one of the big uh, Repeti repeating stories of the of the past year or so um, is Turkey and what's happening there, and uh, I think I'll just start by uh, explaining two um, key events that happened, um, which were, which uh, you need to know about as part of the why why the Turkish government has responded in the way that it has. But one of them was a was a petition uh, called Academics for Peace, uh, signed in uh, January. 2016. It's initially signed by 1,128 academics, and it calls an end for an end to the military operations in the southeast um, against um, an area where there's they were, the military were operating against Kurdish guerrillas. But it called for an end to the operations in civilian areas because of the risk to them, and for an opening of a dialogue to uh, re-establish um, peace. And the second uh, um, key event was the coup attempt in July. 2016, on 15th of July, uh, during which 240 people were killed, uh, 173 were civilians, and uh, over 1,500 people were wounded. Now, this is a key event uh, in the current history of Turkey, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why later, but first of all I want to tell you um, the story of uh, two um, people. One of them is Nuria Gulman, who uh, has become the sort of uh, public image of the purge of uh, academics. She's a, a literature professor at Selçuk University in Konya, uh, who began a protest against being uh, dismissed from a job um, over a year ago, and began, began a hunger strike uh, in March. You know, her protest began, she was protesting alongside another individual, a teacher, primary school teacher called uh, Semi Ozakja, uh, and the two were, were arrested and jailed in May. And uh, they, were, they were on charges of being a member of an armed terrorist organization, violating the law on demonstrations and meetings, and making propaganda for a terrorist organization, facing sentences of up to 20 years each uh, in jail. The protest um, they've been making was daily in front of the Human Rights Monument in uh, Ankara. Uh, and they just had one demand, which was to be able to go back to work. Uh, they wanted the government to follow the constitution the general laws, the human rights, and return us to our work. That was their plea. And uh, in mid-September, um, Nuria was uh, taken into a hospital ward and held there on detention um, because of the her state she was in due to a hunger strike. And uh, she was refusing to attend a third trial of her court hearing. The first one she had missed because the lawyers were arrested and she was not brought to it. And two days before the second hearing, she was uh, taken away and put in intensive care against her will. And now she is refusing attempts to force her to make her defence from a stretcher in hospital. Instead, she demands an open trial and due process. And according to a, a report last about a week ago on the 245th day of their hunger strike, um, Nuria, who is, who is a tall woman, about 5 foot 11, is now just 37 kilograms in weight. Uh, her co-protester, who, who was 87 kilograms, is down to, to 50. Um, but uh, she, she particularly has become the, the face uh, of what's going on. 
As for the human rights monument, that's been fenced off in case anyone else uh, starts protesting for human rights alongside it. Uh, and according to uh, a report in The Guardian, police were concerned that the, the strike would become a, a death fast, spreading uh, and causing a wider protest movement. The other story I want to tell you about is of Sadat Lachina. Um, he's an individual who contacted University World News uh, his fam through his family. He's a former university rector, a former advisor to the Council of Higher Education in Turkey called YOK. Uh, and he's being held in prison. He's well known internationally. He's an author, journalist, scholar, uh, has a degree uh, from, in, from the UK, a doctorate from King's College London, has authored 26 books. Um, and he's now in prison in a, in a prison in Kanakle. Uh, and the indictment against him uh, was accepted in March, um, eight months after he was detained. For eight months, he, he knew nothing. And even after that, he didn't actually know what he was being detained, what exact details of the charge were, what he was supposed to have done. Uh, in a message to University World News from his cell in April, he wrote, uh, I have been in a Turkish prison since the 20th of July, 2016, and I have no idea when I could be free. According to a note I received from his family uh, just last night, he's still in prison. Uh, he's looking very stressed. He's lost a worrying amount of weight. Uh, he's accused of trying to remove the Erdogan government, uh, but he says not a single shred of evidence against him has been presented, uh, and witnesses that have been put forward in, in, in the trials have provided no testimony, no testimony against him. He also faces another charge of being a member of a parallel state, more of which I'll come on to, which is a recurring theme in Turkey, the parallel state, uh, but he denies any involvement in any illegal uh, organization, and his family told me all the charges academics, writers, intellectuals face are unreasonable and absurd, but it's been half a year, and this, this sorry, it's been a year and a half, and this tragedy for Sadat is still being staged. So this is part of the mass purge that has been going on. Uh, they're just two victims, but uh, uh, over 5,700 academics in 117 universities have been sacked. It's a lower figure than you mentioned, John, but it's the figure from Saar, it's always difficult to know which figure is right, but I trust Saar because they have a, quite a good monitoring system. Um, that's the Scholars at Risk Network. Um, and uh, around 100,000 um, employees, public employees, have been dismissed. So it's not just academics alone, but obviously they are being tar targeted. And the purge was triggered by these two events, the Academics for Peace petition and the failed coup. Most of it didn't happen until after the failed coup, but it was, that was then used... Uh, to pick up the people who signed the petition, even though that's nothing to do with the coup, because the coup is alleged by the government to have been um, staged by uh, the movement of Petullah Gulen, um, the, who is now who is based in the US, who is a, a moderate uh, uh, Islamist cleric who, who leads a social movement that funds a lot of schools, um, but was highly influential in Turkey, um, just as um, and used to be an ally of. Uh, Erdogan, his AKP uh, party, they were similar in um, outlook. Um, so it's a strange um, and complicated business that I can't go into all the details of in a short time. Um, but there's a number, the number um, uh, targeted academics is, is staggering. Uh, there are mass expulsions and uh, as has been mentioned, they're prevented from, they lose their job, they can't work in the private sector, the public sector, they lose their pension, um, they're not allowed to travel, they can't get a job abroad. Um, because of that, and uh, their family can't travel abroad either. So basically, they're condemned to a life of uh, poverty, uh, a sort of uh, a sort of house arrest inside your country without being in the house. If you see what I mean. Uh, so this is uh, you know ripping the the, the uh, lives of academics apart, and and many of the reasons for them being arrested are quite seem um, in, as they've been reported to be um, certainly not not of the level you expect. In a, in, a, in a correct judicial system with due process. Uh, so Kandem Badem, one former associate professor at Munza University um, in Tunceli in Turkey, wrote uh, in UWN uh, in uh, February that he, uh, he had been dismissed back in September by one of the emergency decrees after the uh, um, coup attempt. And he thought it was a bad joke because he was openly secular. He's um, atheist and a vocal critic of Gulen and political Islam, but he was dismissed and three days later detained because he had in his office a book by Gulen, even though he had been using the book to criticise him. Um, 
The court released him the next day, but cancelled his passport, blocked his credit cards, his bank accounts and car payments, and left him in indefinite suspension as an illegal individual under, sorry, as an individual under illegal investigation, but with no court indicting or in equipping, equi acquitting him. So this has applied, you know, some of, the, some of the best academics in the country have suffered this fate uh, from various fields, like constitutional law professor Ibrahim Kaboglu, who is a critical of um, the president, the president's plan to change the constitution uh, and to get drastic powers for himself. Um, but uh, the academics themselves have been organising a form of resistance in the form of continuing their lectures elsewhere. Uh, so they're taking lectures in university gardens, in the snow, in public parks, lectures by Skype, lectures by YouTube. They set up academic libraries and cafes, uh, and they're trying to prove to those, they say they're trying to prove to those who expelled us from the public posts that they do not need their titles and functions to be able to do their job. Now, Robert Quinn, the head of uh, Scholars at Risk, says the evidence strongly suggests that academics are facing retaliation for the non-violent exercise of academic freedom of freedom of expression and freedom of association, that these actions are not only attacks on individuals but on higher education as a whole and on Turkish society in, generally, in general. Uh, and, and if not reversed quickly, they will undermine Turkey's status as an international centre for learning and intellectual change. Well, what is all this all about? Is this about the rise of nationalism or authoritarianism? And you, to know that, you have to look back through history. Um, Turkey itself is a very modern country, so there's reason to be nationalistic. It was formed uh, during the First World War when it was saved by Ataturk as the Ottoman Empire uh, collapsed and was surrounded by enemy states trying to pull it apart. So you can understand the siege mentality. But Ataturk, who faced West, abolished the Fez, uh, you know, had quite a different outlook than Erdogan has today, brought in the Latin uh, script, for instance, but was also a bit of a strongman leader, not, not, not known for, you know, not, you know he, he, he had his own purges. Um, um, certainly, but one of, the, one of his legacies was that he left uh, the military as sort of guardians of the uh, constitution uh, and in a position where they felt they should step in any time there's a threat to that. And that's kind of respected by the public at large to quite a large degree as well, it has been historically. So there's been quite a few coups uh, since around 1960 uh, and, uh, or, or, or near coups. And uh, this is, has been sort of a frequent episode in, in Turkish life. Um, that one of the people who tried to change this, and one of the, he did actually change the charter that gave them this power, was Erdogan himself. And that was seen as a major breakthrough. And as, as Turkey was trying to join the EU, many EU, EU leaders supported Erdogan for uh, leaning more towards um, um, international principles uh, um, of human rights uh, and uh, democracy. But now we've seen him try to consolidate his power, and on his way, one of his allies was Fethullah Gulen. Uh, and, but they fell out in 2013, uh, when, when uh, he, Erdogan accused him of being behind a, a corruption investigation into figures in his government. And he, in fact, he issued a warrant for Gulen's arrest back in 2014. So throughout this period, Erdogan has been trying to consolidate power, switching to an executive presidency. And the move against Gulenists could be a response to a real threat. We just don't know if the future trials will establish that as a fact, whether the coup was a Gulenist attempt. Uh, but currently it appears to be one more plank in the strategy of consolidating power. In the pre-Erdogan era, universities were used to enforce secularism, in particular to enforce a ban on wearing headscarves, uh, which um, Erdogan fought against, and the Council for Higher Education uh, implemented this with zeal uh, against divided opinion in, in universities. But in, his, in a speech in May, Erdogan appeared to subtly link the secular ideology behind that drive to the terrorism he sees as a threat to Turkish society, what he calls terrorism. Uh, speaking at the open, opening ceremony of Ib Ibn Haldun University in Istanbul's Halic Congress Centre, Erdogan, sa sa Erdogan said that Turkey would ensure that any opinion could be freely discussed at universities as long as it did not serve terrorism. Now, this petition is counted as something that served terrorism, so you can see how he's shifted uh, the space in which academic freedom can exist. He said that the government struggle is against those who openly support and speak for terrorism, uh, not, diff not ideologies. But he also said that no civilised country in the world would allow terror groups to nest in universities, nor transform universities into training camps for the groups. 
Many people would wonder how we can make this conclusion, you know, that if they, are they nests for training groups for terrorists if uh, some of their academics have been in the Gulenist movement, which largely is about uh, a social movement and about education. Now, even if a few members of it were, and we don't know if there's any evidence yet other than one guy who was involved who was beaten up and only made a, a confession after being beaten up. Um, even if they were, this doesn't implicate thousands of academics who in good faith were part of a, a social and education movement or who were now locked up just because they all uh, had a certain app on their, a Bylock app on their, on their mobile phone. So, uh, uh, and in the same breath as he said this thing about nesting and training groups for terrorism, he stressed that 14 years had been spent countering ideologies which banned students from enrolling at universities based on their clothing and appearance. And this may seem, you know, to, to Western eyes, that's quite a reasonable stance, but it may, under, underlying it, maybe his a sense that he's actually targeting the, uh, the secularist fundamentalist movement that went before his own uh, political Islam. So the question remains whether academics are being rounded up as part of a drive against anyone who supports a rival group or poses questions about the status quo. And academics remain on the front line in this battle. <laughs>